chairman's board. This is a pretty comprehensive but uh, relatively concise update to kind of just cue you up for our budget season, which begins in earnest uh, today. You get, had some activity on the school side yesterday. So we'll summarize all of that and, uh, and really give you a nice place to, to launch off into the whole season. I'm going to let Mr. Durkin come up and walk you through sort of the economic backdrop. Uh, you'll get a deeper dive on that a little bit next month in our revenue work session, but I think it helps to set the stage for a lot of the pressures and things that we're all feeling um, throughout the, the budget world. So no further ado, I'll turn it over to Gerard. Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Casey, um, just a really quick economic update for you. Um, first of all, we'll touch on the real estate market, obviously the largest portion of our budget in any given year. Um, simply put, it's facing headwinds. Um, it's been remarkably resilient in terms of all the pressures that it's facing. Um, I've been up here before and I'll, I'll say again, this is not a similar situation to what we were in about 14, 15 years ago. Um, the situations that we're looking at now are slightly different. Um, inflation is really taking a hit on people's incomes. Um, the values of the houses are continuing to increase, as you can see there. For um, December, the average sale price in the county was up 9.8%. But there has been a kind of conflation, for lack of a better term, over the last 10 years with the lack of supply being built in the market, um, as well as the financial pressure that people are facing now with the interest rates. Um, they have come down off of their all-time peaks over the last um, few weeks. It's the lowest it's been in the last 18 weeks, but it's still... Um, people, if you're buying a $300,000 home, are still paying over $500 more a month in their mortgage payment than they were this time a year ago. <coughs> so there are still some pressures. Um, one of the things that a lot of people, um, myself included, took advantage of with the lower rates was to refinance their homes. Um, with the interest rate market being what it is now, the activity in the refinancing has came back down to pretty much pre-pandemic <coughs> levels. And we have been fortunate in our budget for the last few years to be the recipient of increased recordation taxes. We knew that this was coming. Um, we factored that in to our 23 budget as part of our 24 budget as well. It's not a source that we rely on to cover the base of our operations, but it is something that we monitor closely. And as you can see from that chart there, um, the levels are now down about 85% from their peak um, from just over one year ago. Um, looking at the situation nationally, um, this, this situation is not unique to us. Um, it ha it's happening to all our neighbours and across the entire nation. Um, this is the Case-Shiller Index, one of the national indices that is used to track the housing market, especially with repeat sales, which is what goes into a reval process um, as part of the annual assessment. As you can see there, as of October, the prices were up 9.2%. <coughs> But the house price, house price growth, I should say, is moderating. And that's something that we're seeing also in the county. I know when you look at that chart without some context, it looks, you know, are the prices going down? No, they're not. But the rate of the increase in that growth is slowing down. So looking to our latest land book, um, we, got, we met with the assessor last week on this. The total land book is up just a shade under 10% at $55.4 billion. That is split um, between residential and commercial. Residential just under 44, with commercial just a shade under 12. Um, I will draw your attention to the revaluation box for the residential. That's probably the number that most people are aware of. Um, for calendar year 2023, that is up about 8.8%. Um, going back to that chart, you can see for nationally, it's about 9.2%. So we're kind of really right in that ballpark of where <coughs> things are happening nationally. We are, house prices here are not surging ahead on a growth basis compared to what's happening in the national picture. We're very much in line with what is going on. Um, and the assessments, I believe, have started going out. So they should be coming into people's mailboxes in the next few days. Um, we debuted this chart last year. Um, one of the things that we look at when we're developing our annual budget is we look at the population growth and we also look at the core um, inflation rate year over year change, essentially what was the cost of doing business. Those two factors together really determine, you know, where are we in terms of a residential revaluation in terms of, you know, covering that base growth um, as people move in and as inflation and cost of services increase, that obviously puts pressure, upward pressure on our budget. But we like to make sure that any kind of rate or revaluation changes in line with what that is so that we're not surging ahead of what those core increases are. Um, you all took action last month for the maximum tax rate to drop another penny from $0.92 cents to $0.91 cents per $100 of assessed value. 
um, the reval rate of being 8.8%. With that one cent adjustment, that brings it down to the 7.8% effective um, revaluation rate. As you can see, um, in some years that effective rate kind of goes either above or stays slightly below the cost of the core CPI as well as population. So we're right in line of what basically is essentially the cost of doing business as a result of increases in those two factors. And one of the topics that's been really um, headlining over the last year, again, both locally and nationally, are um, personal property values, especially as it relates to vehicles. Um, with all the supply chain issues that had happened over the last year, that put an upward pressure on the assessment values um, that we, you know, the board took action on last year to effectively increase the tax relief rate for vehicles to help kind of um, cushion that blow from the rising values. Um, we have been working very closely with the commissioner and tracking nationally what's happening as well. As you can see here on the two charts before you on the left and on the right, um, prices are actually coming down and the market is beginning to stabilize, which is a good sign. Um, we will have more updated information as the Commissioner's Office will run those assessments over the next month or so. But right now we are seeing the values of um, basically all vehicle classes from compact cars to vans to luxury vehicles all coming down. Um, anywhere kind of in that average of like maybe 13 to 15% range year over year. So just a quick recap on the personal billing process. Um, the Commissioner's Office are working through the estimated values as of the beginning of this year. Um, we will be working with her over the next couple of months um, to determine what those assessed values would be. Once we know those, then we will come back to the board with recommendations about how to proceed. Um, that could be, again, adjustments to the tax relief. It could be adjustments to the assessment ratios that other places in the state have done over the last year, as well as maybe or may not having to utilise that $10 million personal property reserve that the board set up um, last December. It really just does depend on how the market conditions shake out once we get those evaluations as to what the next steps are. But we have been very cognizant and you all have been very deliberate over the last year to ensure that we can have moderate any such increases um, that we could see. But again, reiterate those values have been coming down so we do not expect to see a repeat of last year as we go through this process. Inflation, hot topic over the last year and continues to be. Um, the reading of December and the core CPI which basically rips out food and energy costs that are more volatile than other sources, it's up about 5.7%. Um, it is dampening, it is down from that increase um, but it could be a long journey ahead. Um, even when you're looking at the core CPI with the food and energy, it is still elevated, as you can clearly see on that chart, compared to um, all the way back to December 2001, if not before. Mr. Chairman, I just, uh, I, I just want to note on here, <clears throat> you know, I've gone back to shopping at Walmart. Not that I, you know, left Walmart, but occasionally uh, I would go in. Now I'm going in there a lot more. And I went in there the other day and bought 18 eggs. It was $9. 18 eggs for $9. And I think when you start realizing and seeing that type of staple going up that amount, people start to really get a sense of what we're up against and in, in, in the economy that's that we're in and the economy that we're going to be in here, it looks like, for the near period. And so I do think we have to keep all of that in mind that People are paying sometimes four times what they were paying for a commodity in the grocery store at Walmart. Mind you, and I shop at night, so you know, it's it's an interesting place to go and shop at night. I'll just leave it there. Um, but it's but but when you when, you, when we have to keep that in mind because people are are going to be dealing with this, and and so as we discuss the budget and as we discuss what we can can and can't do in the future, we just. I, I think we just need to keep that in mind. I, that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And it's certainly something that, you know, um, when I was up here before, Mr. Holland asked about when we look at our budgets throughout the year, it's certainly something that we keep an eye on, especially as you can see on the chart to the left with the energy prices. Mr. Bowles referenced the increase in the prices for electricity and other utilities. We are seeing that. And I will say if my team ever hear me say the words electricity and inflation again, they may actually strangle me. But um, it is something that we keep our eye on pretty much every single month to see what's happening. And as we go throughout the rest of this year and into 24, it's certainly at the forefront of our minds to ensure that we're not caught short on that front. So. Yep. 
Mr. Chairman, if I may, yeah, thank you for mentioning that because one thing I've always been cognizant of and concerned with is managing our budgets and make sure we look at the budget pressures we're facing in the county. So we're not only looking at the revenue side of the equation, we're looking at the cost size, the cost of our budgets for our respective departments and areas. So those are things that I think we want to really be attuned to as we prepare and look at this current budget. So thank you for that comment. Yep. Um, Looking at it closer to home, um, one of the key metrics to be looked at is our sales tax collections. Um, been up here before, you know, you see those large increases over the last two years with the pandemic and some changes to state law in terms of out-of-state um, sales. Um, we knew that this was going to come back down. You know, double-digit increases is clearly not sustainable. Um, but you can see there has been quite a marked slowdown in the last two months, with um, October's numbers actually dipping um, below what they were the prior year. Um, inflation is really taking its toll on the consumer. I will say that when we built our 2023 budget, we did not forecast significant increases in that number. We are not forecast at present forecasting that to happen in 24, precisely because of this reason. But it is something that we monitor every month. And as you can see right now, it is beginning to bite on local consumers. And then turning to labor, um, you know, the last couple of years, the board has really put emphasis on compensation for both the county schools, employees. Labor market is incredibly tight still. It may be softening in some areas. You've seen the headlines, especially with tech companies, laying people off over the last few weeks when they've been on a hiring spree during the pandemic. But the costs to get talent in the front door are still high. Um, the labor costs you can see in the chart there are the highest since 2001. This is um, labor index, which does include salaries and benefits. You know, um, as Mr. Harris likes to say, we are a people business and it does cost a lot of money, especially in this market, to attract and retain talent. And we are seeing that both <laughs> nationally and um, on a county-wide level as well. So, and with that, um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I will turn it over to Mr. Harris. Board members, any questions? Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So this slide really kind of starts to look at your expenditure side of your budget, and again, just we'll touch on it at the very end. But from a process perspective, um, you got the sort of preliminary layout from the schools yesterday. We will come back in February and do, uh, you know, sort of update some of those same topics. Maybe get a little broader on the revenue side, and then the county CIP next month, and then the first part of March is when we wrap all that together with the expenditure side of the house. Um, but that being said, you know, I think given the, uh, the topics that Mr. Durkin just walked through, you know, these are the kind of the, the overall, the, the big themes that we're looking at as we head into this year. So where, how do you find that balance by providing and, and, you know, being attuned to the pressures that are facing, you know, our customers and citizens, as well as recognizing that all those inflationary pressures and those employment costs and all those <laughs> other things certainly having a, uh, a stark impact on the organization to try to thread that needle. We've been in that space for the last couple of years, but probably even more so as we head into this fiscal 24 budget. So uh, as you see, you know, laid out there in the middle part of it, labor market, you know, continues to be, that's been the theme of the last two budgets. And uh, we're gonna continue to push on that. The phase two uh, for the non-sworn personnel on the county and school side, you know, a year ago we said, that's kind of the last thing that came out of our mouths was, you know, we'll pick up the FY24 budget with this topic, and we certainly want to follow through, you know, on that promise to the extent that uh, that we can. That's priority number one, recognizing that, again, all of these inflationary pressures are hitting us in a, in a variety of ways. As we look out over this five-year horizon, there will be upward pressure on debt service on the county and school side. We knew that going in. The referendum's in place. Again, not a lot of flexibility there. We'll talk about schools. Uh, here in just a second. You all have already taken action to lower the rate down to effectively to 91. Uh, can go lower, can't go higher. And then we've spent, you know, as you'll see when we get into the, to the layouts the next couple of months, but a $5 million increase effectively in tax relief program. And that's not all attributed, of course, to seniors. We know there's a veteran component to that, but uh, all trying to, again, be attuned to the, to the folks that, that pay the bills and to, again, where do you find that, that balance point? So just hitting some of those high points, we're going to get into much more detail in all of these things, but <coughs> you know, it's, uh, it, there's certainly no direct path through all of the, the competing forces that we're facing as we head into FY24. 
So just hitting a couple things, again, just trying to set the stage for you as we embark on the next couple months. This is the first overall referendum layout that we have shown you. Last year for just demonstration purposes, as you remember on the capital side, we do a five-year, you actually vote on a five-year plan from the capital side. The first year is the only one that has appropriation. The referendum by its very nature is gonna extend beyond that. So this is what it looks like over seven years. You've already approved the FY23 projects. Uh, you did that last year, speculative basis, hoping that we would get approved, and we certainly had a positive result in November. So we are moving forward now in all aspects of these projects, the Chester Fire Station, um, the Eastern Midlothian Station that uh, you're well aware of, and then sort of the first phases of uh, River City and Horner Park. So that's the things that uh, staff is working on actively. We anticipate a bond sale related to those, uh, unless something you know odd happens in the marketplace, uh, in May, June timeframe. So FY23, we'll move on. So you'll pick up your voting on the referendum projects and the sequencing, of course, with FY24. And then you see that extends out. We believe we would do this over a seven year period. I think that's the most uh, you know, prudent way to go about it. If we can accelerate it short of that, then, then we certainly would. Uh, but we'll go into this more at your CIP work session next month. But again, just trying to give you all and the public, now that the projects are approved, exactly how they would come out of the chute in terms of uh, an ordering. So you see that natural rhythm that we've been talking about for a number of years, where you kind of have the, the, the human service, quality of life items, straddling and alternating with the public safety projects, the police stations and fire stations. So happy to take any questions on this. I know you know the projects, but the, the, the ordering again is a little bit uh, new for you. Um, if that's no question on that, we'll jump over to the school side. And this was sort of the original th thrust, if you will, of this work session. We got yesterday, just and again, process, 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 we'll keep saying that. You got the superintendent's proposal came out yesterday. So that both pieces for them, schools, you know, in fairness to them, is in a very abbreviated timetable. They have to have their full plan over to the county administrator by March 1. So they start before we do. And they did that yesterday at a budget work session uh, starting around 2 o'clock. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time today because it's something we had previously planned uh, on the Stratus update. I'll show you how that kind of overlays with the draft CIP that's out there understanding and admitting that that's just the superintendent's proposal. And then we'll look at some high level remarks from their operating budget, which is a, a little bit more complicated than uh, I think you'll see on the CIP side. So just a little bit of background, because you know there's been some uh, back and forth, I think, in certain pockets of the community about uh, the Stratus platform. And I just want to remind everybody of a few basic things before we get into some of the results. First and foremost, Stratus is a long-range capital planning tool. It is not a platform that sits here to solely uh, deal with school enrollment topics. We, it has built on a certain methodology and we've been able to extend that now into schools. It's been very helpful, and I think you'll see that in just a second. But we also have fire, parks, and libraries are using it to try to understand where their customers are coming from now, and more importantly, where they're likely to come from in the future so that we make intelligent decisions about the placement and ordering of capital facilities. It's the most expensive part of our business, and Stratus really provides us those, uh, those insights. This is the fourth uh, Stratus enrollment projection as it does relate to school because that's where we started off that is of the capital range of capital decisions that is the most uh, difficult to do and it is the, the priciest so that's where we started our efforts four years ago so this is the fourth one of these we only produce a five-year number there are no intervening forecast we produce what we think enrollment will be um, at these in these particular geographies five years from now so next year we will have uh, you know our fifth and we'll you know be able to do a little bit different kind of compare and contrast but this is our fourth one and all of the information uh, is available on the the portal if you go on the website you can drill and see uh, for each individual school we do that every fall and this again this is the fourth time that we've done that overall the model is looking for enrollment aggregate uh, for the system-wide to crest 68,000 students by the time we get to the 27-28 school year. And you saw that was uh, reflected in multiple places 
in the superintendent's remarks yesterday. So certainly steady growth. We, you know, we had sort of a, a bumpy period there with COVID. Uh, a lot of forces coming to bear on that. Folks have generally returned to the system and we are seeing some, some nice growth uh, in terms of students and we'll continue to see that over the next five years. So from a modeling perspective, the way this is built, that does present some challenges because you get a few years there that you're entering in where you get a pattern that's not typical. But it, we have processed that and we are uh, back projecting all the way out to 27, 28. And I'm gonna walk you through not necessarily what each of those projections are by school, but how it overlays with the proposed CIP that we saw yesterday, because that's really at the end of the day what this is all about. So let me orient you to what's on the screen. So we, you're going to see a series of three maps uh, over the rest of the presentation. What's plotted is enrollment capacity as it exists today, in, you know, based on uh, FY27 uh, enrollment forecasting. So said another way this is the capacity of the system held steady and using the stratus projection for what the student counts would be in 27 28 so when you see darker colors darker generally means that there is capacity stress in the system in those areas it is not yet factoring in um, you know what the CIP, what relief the CIP would bring, but that's where we've kind of got off to the side, and then the dots represent where we've got a current project in the system. A current project that is yellow means that it is anticipated to be open by the time these enrollment projections would be true, so you will begin to see where the CIP is providing relief. If there's a blue dot, that means it's an active and identified CIP project as of the superintendent's proposal, but it's not yet in play by the time we get to the 27-28 school year. So you just kind of walk through um, the darkest areas on the map, just, just visually looking at it, and, and, and I certainly don't want to represent that these are the exact pinpoints of any of these facilities. We used the biggest dots we could find just to kind of give a general sense, and again, trying to answer the question, does the stratus forecast line up with what we've seen from not only the referendum, but you know, some modifications that were made in the school layout as presented yesterday. Old 100, um, up in the northern part of the county, certainly could see some capacity constraints there. That's no surprise to anyone. There is a new Old 100 reliever elementary school that has been inserted in the school CIP that was laid out yesterday. And that's not a referendum project, but based on the data and the trends that are out there, uh, they are suggesting that that would be a reasonable project to be inserted ahead of a couple referendum projects. But again, we've got a history of this. We did it in 2013 with Mosley Elementary, and you see that kind of repeating there with Old 100. If you come south, the yellow dot there under Woolridge, uh, that is the Western Area Elementary School. You've certainly got some darker greens there. That, that appears to be a very appropriate project going eastward, A.M. Davis, from a percentage perspective, uh, just about the most uh, over capacity school that we have. A lot of that has to do with the size of the school, but you see A.M. Davis, which would be one of the first projects out of the school CIP lineup, adding 504 seats. So you can really kind of check that one off your list. Fallen Creek, and in this uh, area here with Bensley, Hopkins Road, and Henning, the Bensley rebuild up there adding 403 seats adds quite a bit of capacity to that area but schools has taken a look at this and with the projections in place and are suggesting that alongside with the old hundred reliever there would be a general dale elementary reliever in that area that would be open by the 27 28 school year again it's a very approximate location but you see up here on the the box in the top right hand corner that's a thousand new seats the old hundred adds a thousand new seats uh, the western 360 which is a referendum project adds a thousand new seats and then you get a thousand combined between am davis uh, and bensley you get a few seats out of grange hall which is a referendum project down in the far western portion of the county that's a blue dot because it's it would be outside of that 27 28 area but all in all, the hot spots, if you will, on the elementary lineup from what Stratus says, you know, will be uh, something to pay attention to by we get to 27, 28, lines up extremely well, I would tell you, or I would suggest to you with what uh, we've seen in the school CIP as presented thus far. So 4,000 seats plus or minus by the time we get to 27, 28. <coughs> 
Just a quick question. Um, I'm noticing that in the Midlothian area, your, uh, the capacity forecast is under the 95%. But I was noticing earlier with a, um, a email that I got that the primary amount of building that has occurred has been in the Midlothian area. So I'm a little confused about that. Can you explain that to me? Well, I think it's, you know, the Midlothian district is, uh, as I think you're learning, is a, is a larger area. So it's about where a, a lot of that inf that development is clustered, which is going to be sort of towards the, the western edge. That's why we see coming back in with the old 100 reliever. And I think that is a direct reflection of some of the data that you're referencing. And it's something that we'll continue to work on. But I think if we took the information that's been provided to you by planning and plotted it, I think you would see it line up with some of the trends that we are picking up here in the model, if that makes sense. Mr. Harris, if I could add to that, and it's warranting a separate meeting with you. I think the email you're referring to are zoned lots or zoned units, that is. So, so two things. Some things can get zoned but not built for a longer period of time. Uh, and then two, a um, lot of the units that may be more uh, multifamily or townhome have a far less student yield per unit than, than a single family neighborhood. But we'll go through all those factors with you and we can go, go through what we think the, the absorption rate is the key item for zoned units. So it's, uh, it's not all going to be coming in, in, in this horizon. <laughs> Old 100 is, you know, open now at plus 1,000. You're talking about dropping another 1,000 on there. So you certainly have been able to deal with a lot of those capacity constraints. But it, it's, a, it's a question worth exploring further, for sure. Thank you. As we just switch over to the, uh, the middle school area again, and I'll, I'll try to use the, uh, the pen for the first time. So Tomahawk Creek, you all are already taking action on that, as well as Fallen Creek. So you see those at the very beginning of the school CIP. You have see the two yellow dots there. I think there's no surprise there. Uh, you all took action you know, a year ago with your uh, investments in the SRP that freed up the ability to do this, and those projects are well underway. They are certainly the two uh, hottest areas in, from a middle school capacity perspective, so that lines up well. Uh, the other middle school projects, the Midlothian Middle Rebuild and the other wing on Matoica Middle, they are pushed to the outer edges of this plan to really make room for some of the elementary investments that we just talked through. And from a capacity perspective, you get 300 seats in Midlow. You actually lose a couple seats at putting the other wing on the Matoica Middle School. So that, those aren't really capacity plays and certainly the school CIP places great emphasis on adding capacity to the system, recognizing that these are valuable things. Matoica project, not a referendum, but it's put in here uh, to try to you know, balance out that school and then Midlothian Middle at being 100 years old, as we saw with Grange Hall, both of those older facilities sitting at the tail end and trying to make sure that we uh, are attentive to them from a condition perspective, but the emphasis on capacity and certainly the modeling pays attention to that. You will notice that as you go to the far eastern portion of the county, Elizabeth Davis, still in sort of the dark green color. Um, but you've got some capacity in some of the surrounding areas. That will be a question and a topic that I would suggest to you is kind of one of those things we're definitely have to keep a, a keen eye on as we move forward. Um, I know that the Thomas Dale project does free up the former Chester Middle School uh, building, which has some potential to it. There's no money in the school CIP layout to go in and make investments there, but it does open it up by adding the other seats uh, to the main Thomasdale building and having that sort of reunification of that campus. So you've got potential there, but certainly I would say as you, as you look for what isn't necessarily directly addressed in the CIP's laid out, and there's always going to be something. I don't want to suggest it's not a it's not a fatal flaw by any stretch, but it's probably rises to the top of the list of things that we need to be attentive to as we move forward through the next uh, couple of years. And uh, you know, this CIP will, will shuffle around a little bit. Finally, high schools, a relatively simple story. Cosby, I don't think there's any surprise. Mr. Carroll, you've certainly been a, an advocate for that. That is a referendum project. Uh, as it was laid out here, that would open in 2026, the 26, 27 school years, the way they've got that laid out, adding 2,400 high, much needed high school seats to the western portion of the county. Uh, Meadowbrook being the other kind of 
as we saw in the middle school, the other thing we need to keep an eye on, they have moved some folks around, which you certainly see there is some capacity in adjoining districts there from a high school perspective. Uh, the school board has made some of those movements, maybe some more uh, are, are in line, but something to, to keep an eye on. The good news here from the, the high school map on the eastern half of the county, you certainly have some, some possibilities, and there's no uh, you know, screaming need right now for additional facilities once we get past the uh, the Western Area High School project, which again is a approved referendum project towards the front end, and uh, I know staff collectively counting schools is, is paying attention to that on a daily basis. And Mr. Harris, if I can append to that too, and, and not to take anything from the colors, but this map assumes that there are no students that are ever in CTC Hall or, or the uh, Courthouse Road uh, by L.C. Bird to trade and technical centers or other students who may be out in internships senior year or outside of the school premises. And as you know, in addition to that, we're working to try and maximize the space at CTC Hall with the school. But all students are still recorded at a home school, which lends to the colors of those maps being, being slightly more intense. Again, I'm not taking away from the color intensity. It's just a different footnote disclosure for high schools than it is for middle and elementary. So if we add all that up and sort of take a look at what um, these potential investments or pending investments would do for the system. You see on a system-wide basis, 96%, the numbers that were presented uh, by the school division yesterday. If we just take, we fast forward five years and we look at the stratus figures, the system capacity goes to almost 103%, but just executing the projects that are, would be in place by 27, 28, lowers the system capacity on this projected basis to right around 90%. So it certainly makes a very uh, significant investment in seats, adding almost 9,000 seats across each level of the system. If you look at it on a more granular level, elementary goes from over, almost 96% down to the mid 80s. Middle school, we're recognizing, as we, as we touched on, we still have to be attentive there. And high school, you know, back below where it is today, about 94.7. Recognizing, Dr. Casey said, there's, there's other options, and we are certainly teeing up other investments that will help there. Those aren't, you know, the, the technical center uh, movements. It's not something that the model is able to easily get its arms around, but uh, that's something that we will continue to, uh, to take a look at as we move forward. So, all in all, I think the school CIP looks good. It, it hits the, uh, the, the places that need the most attention. There are some questions, a couple of little areas that we need to keep an eye on for uh, maybe additional interventions as we move through the next five to seven years. But all in all, the CIP, the referendum, and our modeling all line up pretty well. Happy to take any questions on that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I mean, uh, obviously, this is something that um, we are delighted to have Stratus do for us, which is do, the, do these projections. And this is why we go through uh, what we, the iterative process we just went through with the bond referendum. So, I mean, seeing those numbers at the end of the rainbow is exactly what we're, we're trying to get to. Uh, you know, I mean, it, ideally, we're, we're in that range. And, um, you know the the two new middle schools that are going up in Mr. Holland and Mr. Holland's district, and and um, and also the Tomahawk Reliever, which is um, in Mr. Carroll's district, but which will help out Tomahawk Creek immensely, are extremely important, and um, as are all of these other projects. And I'm delighted that we're not just sticking with the bond referendum, but that we're also looking to make these additions where needed, these spot schools where we know we need them. So. I think the message is clear, and that is we're going to make these capital investments in the school system that are needed, and um, we're going to continue to be attentive to uh, the growth in our area. We are a growing county because we are a successful county. We, we have safe, school, uh, safe, uh, safe communities, good schools, and people are going to want to continue to move to a place like that. So um, and, and increasingly, I think we're seen as a job leader. So that will all continue, and we will continue to have these discussions. But I think this is a good plan, and, and I fully endorse it. And I'll, we'll get some more information to you, uh, particularly as we get into late February and March. But I would also, you know, I think county staff has strong confidence in the major maintenance program that the schools is going on way. So that's kind of the other part of this doesn't doesn't show up. This is, you know, really a shift more to capacity versus the 2013 referendum. 
But I think given uh, some of the leadership over there currently, they have really made that a point of emphasis. I think over this five year, they're going to come and, and we're going to have to find ways to, you know, we had that big $50 million dollar uh, investment in major maintenance. They've been able to s use some of the federal funds in a very smart way. So we're going to need to to fill that bucket back up over the next four or five years. But I think as we stand here today, they're in good shape. Uh, they have very, very good records and, and, and materials that we can provide you to show all of the activity that's happening on the major maintenance front. So, you know, that when it, we sort of stand up here and give endorsement and, and, and feel good about the capital plan, I don't want that to get lost. I think that's also going going very well. So switching gears, um, and I won't get into too much depth on this, but the uh, superintendent did alongside his capital plan, which we just went through, uh, went through the operating layout yesterday. So I just want to point out a couple of things and, and maybe have a little bit of back and forth discussion on this. So the, again, process, 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 the pr budget that came out yesterday is simply a proposal by the superintendent. It has been received now by your counterparts on the school board, um, but it is just that. It is just a proposal and the superintendent is in a tough spot when it comes to the information that's available to him. We are just beginning our process. Uh, the state provides some information right before Christmas, but you don't have a whole lot of firm uh, numbers from the General Assembly. So it's difficult to do, but it's a very, very early and preliminary part of the process. I can't stress that enough. That being said, uh, he did come out and say, based on the things and his survey of the school division's needs, that the, his plan is $16.8 million short of being balanced. Um, you know, I think as it compared to recent layouts at this time, you know, in the process, it's certainly a smaller number than we've seen. I think for those of you that have been on the board for a little while, it's not that long ago, we were staring at a hundred million dollar number. So, you know, everything has to be, you know, sort of taken in context. Our initial, again, you haven't even seen, the, you won't get the county administrator's proposed budget until, you know, March 8th, March 7th, somewhere in there. But what we know today and what we have planned on from our five year plan from last year is a base $17 million increase. You did see that in their materials yesterday. That's a, a, a healthy number. Doesn't necessarily mean it's the final one, but it is the number that we really have to commit to this time last year. And that's what we have been in you know, regular contact with Dr. Tallis and his folks. And we said, we're going to stick to that number. We can make the 17. Again, doesn't, it's kind of like the tax rate discussion. We doesn't necessarily, we're not necessarily we're going to go below it. We may be able to go above it, but from a planning perspective, uh, you know, we're providing that to him before, you know, Mr. Bloomfield and his staff can even bring us the, the final assessment notices. So 17 is where we said. You didn't see this mentioned yesterday, and that's sort of unfortunate, but we have communicated and worked with our school uh, peers to say, we recognize, we, we have a lot of shared services that we do with schools. And I think we've, you know, that's been a topic in this boardroom many, many times. Because of the inflationary impacts and a lot of things we've been doing for the workforce, those costs have increased. So what we said is we will take a pause on passing those increased costs along to the school division, still offering the same level of service, no services reduced, no services eliminated, but just not passing along those increases right now, recognizing all of the things that are swirling around. So that has an over a million dollar savings. So not, and this is kind of where this gets tricky and where I think everybody just has to take, you know, a little bit of caution with some of the things that are in the presentation. Not everything happens on the revenue side of the house. It is possible to get relief on the expense side. It doesn't necessarily show up in a state formula. It doesn't show up in pretty dollar bills, but it's still there and it's still real money that they're able to invest in other things. And that's just another good example from, uh, from right now today. Um, the ERP replacement system, again, this is a way that we support the school division. It didn't show up in necessarily some of the metrics that get cited and you're gonna get emails about, but just keep these examples in mind. $13 million cash investment over the next two budgets that will go into the, the backbone system that from a financial perspective that supports both organizations and the county is picking up the full tab of that. Uh, it, it, you know, from a employee perspective, it's supporting 4,000 folks over here, you know, nine, 10,000 over there. So they certainly get a, a significant benefit from it. They're at the table, they're partners in the procurement and the, uh, the requirements and all of those things, but we are paying you know, for that entire bill. So, and there certainly is some, I wouldn't suggest it, 
but in, in the superintendent's per, uh, presentation, there's some examples of other ways that we support the division, but I'm here just to tell you, there continues to be all of these things. It's not just that top line transfer number that you need to pay attention to. We continue to be engaged even today with uh, school staff as we get more information to try to you know dial this thing in further as we move throughout the process. I would sit here and tell you, I do believe there are reasonable pathways through it. $16.8 million does sound like a lot of money, depending on you know, where, where you're coming from, how you're looking at it. But some examples, just very quickly, there is $6.2 million of that 16.8 that you could attribute to the phase three of the teacher pay plan. Um, you know, that was a component that was discussed in early consultant rounds. Uh, I don't know if you would necessarily say there was ever a commitment to doing that. We don't have a phase three for uh, public safety. And as you remember, public safety and classroom personnel were the first ones out of the gate. So public safety has taken a pause on that now, and they are firmly on the step system at two and a, two and a quarter percent. On the school layout, there is a phase three that's in addition to uh, keeping the teachers on the STEP plan, which is something we're all firmly committed to. So there's a 5% that includes the STEP and some of the money from the state, and then there's another 1.5% that would be equivalent of that phase three. That's $6.2 million. I'm not here picking winners and losers. I'm only suggesting to you that's a difference between the budget that you're going to receive when we get to March 8th and what was discussed yesterday. Another smaller difference, but something, you know, every penny matters. Uh, their health care renewal assumption was plus seven, ours is plus five. I think those things should be in line. We have the ability through the health care fund, as we proved this year, to deal with larger renewal increases than what might be in the budget. Five might not be the number, seven might not be the number, but we have saved within that fund over the period of the last six or seven years to be in a position to deal with those items. Uh, that's another area, an easy area, I think, where you could find some savings. In addition, their use of one-time money does fall from 15 to 10. Uh, we have been in communication with them before they presented the budget and said, look, we can help you keep that at $15 million. You got a lot, as, as Mr. Durkin's charts, I think did a really nice job showing and pointing out, there's a lot of things that are one time or you know, hopefully not here forever in terms of inflationary pressures. And so I think that is a reasonable time and reason to use some one-time dollars, hopefully even as a hedge. Hopefully some of those costs come down, electricity, eggs, whatever it might be, and you don't need to tap into all that. So if they just left it at 15, which we've offered to help with, yeah, that's the pay plan. That's 11.2 of the 16, just in a couple of strokes of the pen. So I think there is a reasonable path forward. You know, we're going to continue that work as we always do through the balance of January and into February. But I would just, again, stress the early, early place that we are in the process. The last point on here, you do get the standard talking points of this year. There was a series of $3 bills that were included in the, in the presentation. They're very, they're very pretty. Ms. Spillman, who's coming up here after me, actually designed those uh, many years ago. But this suggests that the level of investment that you all have made in your watch in the school division has dipped from some percentage from X to Y. The problem with that is, you know, I can't choose what goes into the dollar bill. Everything is invested and shown in the dollar bill from a transparency perspective, as Mr. Holland would know. And last year happened to be a year where we invested a lot of one-time money into the capital side on the, on the county CIP. So that all flows through there. If you pull those dollars out and make a couple other small similar adjustments, that three percentage point decline turns to about 0.7 or 0.8%. And we could sit here and go back and forth all day long. My message to you is don't buy into that stuff right off the bat. Those are very, very nuanced things. They are not apples to apples. You can't go every single year and assume that it's, you're comparing the same things throughout time. You just can't do it. And it's not anything they did or we did. It's just the way that the business evolves. There's other things that other revenue streams that get picked up in that analysis. And we're just going to show it all in those sheets. Another example that it really didn't come across in the presentation was the investments that you made in SRP that frees up $9, 10000000 million on the expense side. So you, know, you can see a top line transfer number only goes up $10 million. 
but save $10 million on the expense side. Again, that doesn't show up in a dollar bill. It doesn't show up on a transfer number, but that's real money that they were able to spend. So last year, that certainly, certainly was a big part of the conversation. And again, doesn't bubble up to the top. If you're just picking that up and flipping through the slides, if you're a reader at home or you're watching it on the six o'clock news, I think that's unfortunate, but we will continue to try to, you know, tell a, a whole story when it comes to that and, and be very deliberate in, in the math that goes into those calculations. With that, I'm happy to take any questions on the, uh, on the school operating budget. Board members, any questions? Um, just, just a couple of statements. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things I know we continue to fight is, um, uh, as counties and schools, is this notion of unfunded mandates from the state. And so as I looked at our preliminary list of expenditures for the county coming up because we're in this sausage making process of putting the budget together is, <clears throat> again, the pressure that is coming from all fronts on the local government from areas in which the state government is just not meeting um, its, its duties and obligations to constitutional offices, to our school system, um, you name it. And, and so when you you take that and then you also take this economic environment you also take um frankly what's happened over the last couple of years with staff across the board and how much more expensive it is to keep good people on and 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 it's you know good people have a good market to demand more pay across the board right now so we we have to balance all of that out and I, but I, I i do see all of it and I know the pressure that teachers and staff and administrators have been under the last few years, absolutely. Also know the pressure parents have been under and even uh, folks, you know, other folks, um, other families. Uh, so you look at all of it and you go, we have a balancing act here and we need to get all the information. We need a budget from the state uh, I know Mr. Holland and I will review this in audit and finance uh, as well, and I don't not, I'm not exactly sure what date that is, but um, we'll, uh, you know, I expect to do a deeper dive uh, during those meetings as we you know work through this process. But I, I mean, I'm trying to keep all of this in mind, and I know my colleagues are shaking their heads because there's a lot of pressures on the budget every year. But it does seem like this year there's a, there's an inflection point with the way the economy's headed with the national recession and all of the money that was spent over the last few years causing these inflationary pressures in the United States. So we, we've got to we've got to contend with that. Yes, sir. Thank you. Any other, anybody else? Continue. Yeah, just I mean, I real real quick. So again, you see as many months that are still listed here. We're only in January, very early, early in the process. We are, Mr. Winslow, to your point, we are with audit finance. Uh, first ten days or so of February, and we'll drill into uh, a lot of these. But I won't go through all the the pieces and parts. But we, again, today kicks off on our side the budget season. We'll be back in front of you uh, in February, in March, through your community meetings through the middle of March, through your public hearing at the end of March, and then voting uh, in very early April to, to put all this in motion. So there are a lot of cards to be played, a lot of information, Mr. Winslow, to your point, uh, that we will still learn between now and then. Hopefully we get some, some positive breaks on the state side. And with that, I think that's a good segue to, uh, to Ms. Spillman to, here's to give you an update on what's going on uh, downtown at the General Assembly if there aren't any other questions. Thank you, Mr. Harris.